This is John Dauches from Synergist Technologies. Welcome to today's broadcast webcast. Today's topic we'll be covering is getting up and running with subscription. So the main point of tonight's discussion will be talking about um, technical involvement you will have to know and things you might consider um, in trading and managing your Autodesk account when you're moving your licenses from maintenance and perpetuals to subscription. Today we'll be having our speakers will be Darren Green and Mark Lancaster. They are two members of our Synergist Help Desk team and are at an Autodesk Elite status. And as you can see by the screen, they are actually one of the top three um, solution architects authors um, on installation and licensing in the world. And we're happy to have them um, be part of our team and have our discussion uh, for us today. Just a couple housekeeping um, items. Uh, you'll see that you'll have a Q&A section on your panel. Feel free to type any questions that you might have or would like to be addressed. If we do not address them during today's broadcast, we will certainly follow up with a Q&A at the end of, the, of the end of today's session to address those specifically. And as well, if there's any topic that you might see that might be briefly discussed uh, in today's broadcast, uh, we are be planning to do a, a series of minuet videos um, to go deeper dives in any in any specific um, topic. So if you have any suggestions, if you'd like to see a topic be presented, uh, please provide your suggestions. Now I will turn over the floor to Darren Green and Mark Lancaster. Hello everyone, this is Darren Green. Um, I'm on the product support team at Synergis. And again, just to reiterate in regards to what uh, John was just talking about, you know, we are on the Autodesk forums, which is a public forum. So we answer questions there as well as in-house, right? So when you guys call into Synergist to support line, you know, we're always there to support you. Us being in the top three tier of the uh, top most accepted solutions on the Autodesk website, you know, that says a lot. You know, both team members on the forums are in the top or an elite in the uh, forums, you know, it shows that we are working with people closely to troubleshoot and resolve a lot of technical issues around installation and licensing, um, among other forums as well. But this is just the, uh, in regards to move to subscription, it's all about licensing and installation. So I'll go ahead and pass it over to Mark and he can get the agenda laid out for you guys and then we can continue from there. Afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Lancaster, and I'm the product support specialist for the Autodesk manufacturing product. Today's our agenda is that we're going to talk about the facts. You know what the uh, single user subscription and multi user subscription. And then we're going to get down to breaking out the difference between a maintenance versus subscription how you're going to assign your software coordinator, which is very important when you're talking about a single user subscription license, how you assign your users access and benefits, you know, what is the timeline to switch over, and finally just a few other items uh, to cover that's kind of related to subscription. So some facts about a single user. In the past, when you had perpetual license, there wasn't really a lot of stuff that the software coordinator or the contract manager for your subscription had to do. When you get into single user subscription um, type of license, there's some account management aspects that you have to cover. And Darren Green will show that a little bit later on. So just keep that in mind that when you have a single user subscription license, there's some management you have to do behind that. Basically, you're signing the user's access and those type of things. In order to use a single user-based license, the user must be assigned the benefit of the software. Without that, the user is going to get a message that they must contact the contract manager in order to, to, order to obtain permission to use the software. It does require a user to sign on, all right? It is based on the Autodesk ID or the name account that the product is assigned to. The other important thing that may not have been important in the past because the activation was per the machine, the user has to have full admin, full admin rights on their system in order to create the license information 
to activate or authorize the license. The nice thing about single user license subscription is that you can access it anywhere, anytime, because it's based on the user's ID. You also have the ability to use the product on a 30-day offline period, and we're going to, and I'm going to talk about that here shortly. The big thing that we'd like to point out to everybody is that it's just not designed for single computer, numerous users. There's a lot of people that have a single computer and there's different people that walk up to the computer and try to use the application. A single user term license is not designed for that. All right. And like I said, it is very important as account management of it that you define individual, separate individuals for your contract manager role and software coordinator. Next. So what does it mean by the 30-day offline guide or, you know, what happens? A lot of people don't realize that every time in a single user subscription license, every time the product is launched, it actually phone home. All right, it's contacting the Autodesk servers. It's checking to make sure that your term license is still active. If it does not find an internet or a live internet connection out there, it actually starts what's called the 30-day offline counter. Once it finds the internet upon your launch of the application, it resets the counter. If you're off the grid, let's say you're at a job site or you know, you're just someplace where there's no internet, it will allow you uh, or start prompting you seven to ten days uh, before that 30-day uh, time is up. If you do not connect by the 31st day, the product doesn't work. It needs to connect to activate it. So just keep that in mind. A lot of people don't also realize because they came from that perpetual license, single uh, standalone license, where activation was just once you needed the internet activated, the machine is activated. With single user license, it's not for restricted, limit, or you know, no internet environment. So if you're in that environment where you have no internet, single user license is not going to work for you. Okay, I'll turn it back over to Darren. All right, so in regards to multi-user, you know, there's light account management task that needs to be done and that's basically to allow users to download and install um, updates and product enhancements it's mostly product enhancements not updates right so without having your users created and assigned to a product and also the updates they're going to be stuck in a transition where they're just regular users for the Autodesk software so they're not going to see any product enhancements such as you know um, tools, additional tools for Revit or AutoCAD. It also requires that you set up a license manager utility. So just like it was in maintenance, you have the same capabilities in term-based, right, which is multi-user licenses. So in the multi-user license, it works the same way. The only difference is that inside the license file, you have an expiration date, but you will still configure the same license manager and use a network license file. So if you guys move from maintenance to subscription, there's no need to uninstall any software. You just update your license file, continue with the software you already have in your environment, and then move on from there. The good thing about multi-user is that it's the single source of truth, right? Because if anything breaks or if there's any trouble, you only have one location to troubleshoot the issue, whereas if it was standalone, again, you would have one place unless it's affecting multiple users, right? So network licensing, you have one server that you update every year with the newer versions, and everybody will be working as they are today. Borrow licenses for off-site use. So when you guys go um, on-site to client location or out in the field, you, know, you want to borrow a license from the pool. It's the same as it was in maintenance plan, so there's no difference there. However, there is a difference that I'll get to later on in the slides, so for now, uh, let's just leave it at borrow licenses are the same for maintenance or for multi-user as it was for maintenance. But like Mark said in regards to single user, the internet is not required in this case, right? So 
single user requires the internet connection, so for government agencies, uh, companies where they don't allow people to access the internet or out the outside world, you want to use multi-user because that's all internal to your organization. Mark? So let's go on to the next topic and start breaking down what a standalone versus single user. So when I talk about standalone, that's a you know perpetual license uh, on a um, maintenance plan. So on the maintenance side of it for that standalone, like I said, internet is only needed first launch. Um, two installs per the license. Standalone, you know, it's it's per the machine slash user, and you have the access to the three legacy version. The reason that we're pointing this out is that between a maintenance plan and the subscription plan, you really haven't lost any benefits. All right, you still have the legacy versions, the travel uh, or the global travel rights, and those type of things. But look, breaking it down, just kind of think under that single user aspect, you know, like I said, when you install it, upon that first launch, you need an internet required. It, it, that's what you need. Every launch uh, past that, like I said, will phone home, but it can go into the 30-day offline grid uh, mode. The nice thing about the single user subscription is that you can install it on as many machines that you want to. Just because you have one license, I can install it on 10 machines. But the activation or the authorization comes from the named account that's being used. And we're going to talk about the name account a little bit later on. And based on that, anywhere, anytime is because the, the user is signing into the software. Same thing access to the three legacy version. And so as you can see in that diagram, you know, I could be home, I could be in Starbucks, I could be at the office, I could be at the client site. If there's internet access out there, I'm good to go. Even if there isn't internet access, you are still good to go because you are going into that 30-day offline period. Okay? Not going to go into, e you know, uh, every detail, but just breaking out that, like I said, the benefits are the same, you know, the global travel rights, the home use aspect of it, all right? The key to this single user is the license is tied to the user, not a machine. And that's why it makes it hard for, you know, if a machine breaks down, I have to go to another machine, well, I got to go install it, I got to activate it, those type of things, all right? Whereas a single user subscription, I am tied to that name account, so I can just get up, go to that other machine, and log in. All right. Another big benefit about the single user subscription is that in my Autodesk account for the contract manager software coordinator, I have a little bit more ability to manage my license. I know where that license is going. Where in a perpetual standalone license on maintenance plan, it, I don't really know, was it activated on this machine? Was it, you know, those type of things. So it gives you a little bit more uh, ability to manage your license. All right. And the last thing I just want to point out, your global travel rights in the past used to be 90 days. It is now based on the term of your active maintenance plan or subscription plan. So, yeah, switching over to uh, network versus multi-user. So, again, network seats. They're all internal, so there's no internet that's needed. The only time you need internet access is to generate that network license file to put on your server. But with maintenance, um, you may you may have an expiration date that was started back in 2015 release, I believe, where Autodesk started to introduce expiration dates on your licenses. Um, it was kind of moving in that transition to a subscription already way back then. But uh, typically in a maintenance plan, you won't have an expiration that would say permanent. Subscription, you will have that expiration date. And once that expiration date come up, or before it gets to the expiration date, you will get a license file from Autodesk uh, once you renew your contract at the end of the year. Uh, mostly it's within uh, first or a few months before your contract ends, um, you will start getting calls in regards to renewing your subscription. With maintenance plan, you have a cascading order that was slightly different, but for subscription, 
the cascading order is a lot different in regards to term-based licenses when you have a mixture of maintenance and subscription. So for example, if you have collections and you also have suites, you know, the cascading order, the first one is going to pull as a collection. Okay, so we'll move that to the side for a later discussion here that we're going to come up shortly. Um, and then borrowing licenses that work the same. You borrow a license for all site needs on a maintenance plan uh, for multi-user, you do the exact same thing. Um, you just borrow the license. However, uh, when combining subscription with perpetual licenses, again, that becomes an if statement, right? Whether or not you're pulling the right license when you logged into the program, but by default, by default, you're gonna actually pull a term-based license before a maintenance license. So also, um, home use requests. So for maintenance plans, when you will request a home use license, Autodesk will send you a serial number to use at home or on another laptop that's always out in the field for on-site work or off-site work. Maintenance plan, you also have maintenance and subscription. You have access to four versions back. Uh, this started with the 2018 license files. So only when you have a license file that was generated for the 2018 version, you'll go all the way back to 2014. Global rights is the same across the board, so there's no difference there. So as you can see, there's a lot of similarities in regards to network versus multi-user, right? So the licenses are consumed per legacy version. In regards to maintenance, so what that means is basically, um, Whenever you open up an earlier version of the product outside of what the core license is for, so for example, if you get a license that's a 2018, I go back four versions. If you open 2018 AutoCAD and you open 2018 Inventor, you're going to pull one license. As soon as you start going to different versions, you'll pull, you'll pull multiple licenses. Okay, so 2018, 2017, and let's say 2015, you'll have three licenses at that point that you're consuming from your license file. That's the exact same thing in regards to subscription unless you're using collections, right? So collections, you pull that first product, everything else will fall right into that, that uh, license file as long as it's within the collection. So also a license file needs to be generated every year or whenever you guys upgrade on a maintenance plan in regards to subscription, you get that upon renewal of your contract. So let's take a look at how we actually assign software coordinator because that plays a big part in this as well. So when you first move from maintenance to subscription or even before that, you want to go into your Autodesk account site and assign a software coordinator. So by default, the person who is purchasing the software and in charge of all the emails that come through from Autodesk about renewals and things like that, that's the contract manager. Most of the time it's an accounting person or finance or even upper management. The software coordinator is the person that's like a CAD manager or an IT specialist at your company that manages your user base, your CAD user base. So. Contract managers have to go in here, and under the Autodesk account, there's a section for users. Under Quick Links, you have a link there for managing the software coordinators. The next page, once you click the link, in some cases we've seen where there's an error message that come up on that page, and mostly it's because it takes too long to refresh the information, right? In that case, reach out to Synergist or your account manager, and then we can get that information resolved for you, or get the contract coordinator or software coordinators assigned to a user for you. And we will send that information up to Autodesk and Autodesk would do it on the back end. But generally you could just go in, it'll bring up the page, you select the contract. You have to click the contract and then assign the uh, user to a product. You can't, assign the con you can't assign them to an entire contract, you have to assign them to the products within the contract, if that makes sense. So on the next page, you'll have something where uh, you'll have two tabs, which is software coordinators and products. So click the products, check all the products you want to assign the software coordinator to, and then hit the assign button there. 
So contract managers, they have to be the ones creating the uh, software coordinator roles for your company. So how do we go about creating users? So just the regular user base, and when we talk about single user, this is definitely required, but it's also required for multi-user uh, seats as well. So if you guys have network or standalone, you still want to create these user accounts because like I said in the beginning, you know, we have to give users access to product enhancements, right? So they can see uh, new functionality that's being introduced in the software. Right, so from the Autodesk account page, again, you go to your user section. First thing that we see here is add, right? So we have the ability to add a new user and then here, there's multiple sections here. The first one is add a user, which you can do one at a time. So you put in the email, first and last name, and what that'll end up doing is creating one user account. However, there's a button there for add another user that you can click and it will start to append new users to the list, right? So sort of like a bulk ad. Inside of the ad function is also a bulk ad, which you have to follow the formatting here. But again, you can add up to 50 users at a time as long as you're following the same formatting code there and assign access to all 50 users at one shot. This, uh, this checkbox here plays a big big role here, right? So it's checked by default just in case you and accidentally you just click save and continue. So once you do this, you'll have access to all 50 users at once to assign a particular product to, as well as services or updates and enhancements, things like that. So what does it look like after we put in the uh, user's information, click save and continue? On the left-hand side, we see that we have a checkbox for assigning a product to that user. We can do the same thing with product updates and support. On the right, we have a bulk add where we're adding multiple users at one shot. So the biggest difference here is that you, know, you have a single user and you'll have to click through each user, edit their access, and assign products. Okay? Or with the bulk add, we could just assign all 50 users to an individual product. So the easiest way to go is the bulk add. A lot of IT people love this capability because they can go into Active Directory, extract all their user accounts, format it nice and neat, and then paste it into the bulk add. As long as it's within 50 users, they shouldn't have any problems with going through and assigning user access. The next thing is about, or about creating the user accounts is that we have to make sure that they're using the correct contract number for both sections. So if we're going to assign 3ds Max to my contract ending in 3913, I want to make sure I give that user the same access to product updates and support for that same contract. If I don't, what will end up happening is when I go and sign into the product or that user go and sign into the product, they're going to see uh, messages about contact your software coordinator to get permission. Even though you know you gave that user permission, but the difference is you'd never assign them to the updates and support. So unless they're both um, are assigned to that user, they could run into problems like that. So we always recommend doing this from the start instead of uh, finding out whether or not if the user will get an error or not, right? Another key here is that we have a section right next to our contract that tells us whether or not if it's a single user, a multi-user, or even a perpetual license. So the blank label is there that represents perpetual or maintenance plans. Uh, anything that has a, a label, single user or multi-user, those are the term-based licenses. That's subscription. So <clears throat> the reason why we want to give users access to products that are on maintenance is because their services like 360 services, cloud storage, um, even cloud um, hubs, right? So A360 hub or BIM 360 or Fusion 360, these things have to be assigned to users as well. The difference is you wouldn't see single user or multi-user um, next to the contract for those, right? You would just see the name of the product along with the contract and how many seats that are available. 
So this is key to make sure that when you assign users access to a product, just check the assign button right next to the, uh, the number of seats available. That way they're getting everything within that product, all services. This is something from the Autodesk site. This talks about the roles of contract managers and software coordinators. Okay, the first column, as you can see, contract manager have access to everything except for receiving email notifications to download new releases. By default, they do have that access, but if they do have a software coordinator, that, that is moved over to the software coordinator instead of the contract manager. So I'm not going to go through each one of these capabilities that are available uh, for each uh, role, but the biggest thing is to know that your software coordinator is assigned to a CAD manager or an IT person. Your contract manager is the person who is in charge of renewing those licenses, right, who can make that purchase without having to go through multiple channels. And, you know, it's easier for the contract manager to manage that aspect and the software coordinator to manage the CAD users and the products and updates and everything else. So we're going to talk about the time to switch over, which is Mark. Go thanks, Darren. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Darren. Great information about managing and creating your users. So in the past, when you had perpetual license and you were making switches in that uh, period, there was normally a 30-day grace period that Autodesk allowed for you to get the new software on, run a test, to get it up and running, and then the ability to uninstall. With this transition, Autodesk is saying that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit undertaking and, you know, it's not going to happen, you know, or everybody's going to, you know, smoothly transition into this. So they're indicating that there is no grace period for this transition. However, they still recommend it, you know, do it as soon as possible to give you the most benefits, all right? One of the nice things that Autodesk is allowing is that you can continue to use your perpetual license, the, the ones that you converted over uh, to subscription um, until you're ready to make that transition. A couple things you have to uh, keep in mind that even though that the, the rules, guidelines, the terms are kind of basically the same is that once you make that switch, um, those, even though that you're using perpetual license, you have to abide by the terms of your the, the, uh, subscription, right? So what Autodesk is saying that it's your timeline. Do it when it's convenient for you, you know, less disruption to your organization, those type of thing. But like I said, the recommendation is still try to do it as soon as possible. And if you have an existing um, network license type for perpetual, really the only thing that you have to do is to generate a new license file, license file with your term. There's no need to uninstall um, your products. And we're going to talk about, you know, how do you make that transition with the, your, you know, your your community or your computers that, you know, it's running the software. Next. So how do you make that switch from maintenance to subscription, all right? Well, the key is if you're upgrading, so let's say you're on 2015 and now you want to go to 2018, basically you're going to install the required version and uninstall the legacy version. If you have an existing network license type for your perpetual license, there's really the only thing that you have to do, as I stated on the last slide, is to update your license file. There's no need to uninstall software because it's all based on the network license file. When you get into the standalone license going to single user subscription, if you have products that are pre-2017, you do have to uninstall the product. We recommend doing a Autodesk uh, clean uninstall, which wipes out all the registry information, you know, gets that machine all reset for the new one, and then put the uh, software back on, all right? That, that's the only way you can do it if, you, if you're using anything before the 2017 product line. If you're using 2017 or 2018 currently, I mean, most of it, you know, um, is probably, either going to be carried or perpetual license or you're already under that subscription base, you have to do what's called a license reset. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. All right. 
Next. So basically, I'm not going to go into the license reset steps, but basically, you're going to go to some folders, delete some files, start the product up again, and then um, it will um, ask you to prompt you for the serial name. Ask us and uh, we'll send you that email with that information. Next. So earlier I talked about the named account. When we talk about single user subscription, it is name. All right. Some points or facts that I want to point out about the Autodesk account. It can be signed in three times concurrently or however you want to look at it. So for example, I can be signed in my application, I can be signed in my A360, and also the desktop application. Those are considered three separate logins, all right? I could do, I could have application on one machine, I could go to another machine, log on to A360, or I can go to another machine and log on and use my desktop application. However, you have to keep in mind that the ID can only be used once to launch and authorize the application. So for example, if I'm working at my office and I have um, decided I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna do some work at home, I have to sign out at the office and then I can sign in at um, using my software at home. So just keep that in mind that the ID can only be used once to activate the pro uh, product. Another thing is, is that you do not share your Autodesk ID, meaning that, hey, we've got five copies of the single user. I'm just going to create a generic login. No, you can't do that. You, you have to have the product assigned to each named account, all right? So like I said, it's required for each user. You're not going to share it, all right? The other thing is, as Darren pointed out when he talked about, you know, adding users and defining their benefits. Those are those things that you have to sign to the user or they will not be able to use the software. And the another nice thing to do is for the software coordinator or the CAD uh, contract manager is they have the ability to restrict what the user sees, that name account sees in the desktop application. So for example, if you don't want your users to apply updates, you can restrict them for seeing the updates in the desktop application. So that's another benefit that could be assigned to the named account. Okay, next. Thanks, Mark. All right, so um, in regards to network licensing, a lot of customers go out to their resellers or bars or even Autodesk to generate these license files. Um, this capability is given to you as well that you can log into your Autodesk account and generate them yourself. The biggest difference that I see is with uh, you guys generating licenses versus a VAR or Autodesk, is that it's faster, so you get it within a matter of seconds after you click the submit button. Also, when we submit them, we have to go through register once, which a lot of you may have heard of registeronce.autodesk.com. And when you get a new contract, what happens by default is that on register once, it only gives you the first license so if you get in this if you put in a serial number for 2018 it'll only give you 2018 licenses it won't give you the four versions back okay so be aware of that when uh, the next time you guys go and generate license files go through your Autodesk account generate them all at once it'll be easier and a lot faster for you guys and a lot less complicated so when you're generating a license the first two pieces of information that's um, very important is the server name and the MAC address, right? The MAC address, you cannot have any uh, dashes in there, so be aware of that. I know some people just copy and paste. Um, however, make sure you remove the dashes, otherwise it'll chop off probably about four or five uh, numbers from your MAC address. So remove those, copy and paste then. 
So that's the most important piece that's related to network licenses. The server name, you could change the server name after you generate the license. That's not a problem. The MAC address, you cannot do that. So once you click on Generate Network License Manager, or Generate Network License File, and you put in your server name and your MAC address, and you click the button to select and add products, you'll get a, se a selection list of all your products that are network-based. So you won't see any products in there for single user. It'll only be for multi-user. Okay. So there's a checkbox that you can hit check all. It will select all those products. You add them to the list and generate the file. When you do that, it creates the license right then and there. Uh, literally like one second. And then you just do a save the file. You can email it to yourself or even copy it on your clipboard and paste it into a notepad document. <clears throat> So, Mark, talk about the industry collection rules, right? So, just some things to point out um, for the industrial collection, because we, we're asked this uh, numerous times. There is not a single download for the collection. A lot of people are always in that mode of, hey, I've done this for suites for many years, where's the collection? Autodesk did not provide a single download for the collection. Um, you, uh, you will basically download the individual products. However, you can actually use your suite products to install or create deployment. So you can find the, a related suite that's most you know, close to the application that you want and use the suite download to create the deployment. Right? A little bit easier. You don't have to you know, get into, I got to install AutoCAD, I got to Civil 3D or these type of things you can just use the deployment to do that. So that's a little trick uh, to get you going. The other thing with single user, uh, which is very confusing to people, is that when you go to authorize a collection, a uh, single user subscription, the serial number is based on the collection, but the product key is per the individual product. So if I'm putting AutoCAD 2018, I would put the serial number for the collection, but I would use the product key associated to AutoCAD 2018. For multi-user starting in the year uh, when the 2070 products was released, when you're prompted to sign in, enter serial number slash product key or network, the nice thing is, is that for the multi-users, there's no serial number uh, product key required anymore. Okay? And a lot of people are a little shocked by this rule, but back when suites were introduced back in the 2012 product uh, product relying release, Autodesk uh, came up with this business rule that you really should only have two Autodesk products open. So that that carries over in the collection aspect of it. All right, it is a rule, like I said, established back when suites were introduced. And it's based on a lot of it has to do with performance. So Autodesk is saying, if you've got three or four products running in a collection, you're just you're decreasing uh, production, uh, you know, performance of your PC. So that's why they came up with that rule. Okay. I would also like to add, Mark, um, in regards to downloading and installing products, uh, using the suite is definitely a, a great option, a great fit for a lot of customers. Many people are not aware of it. Um, so, when you install from the suite, you're not going to put the serial number in for any of your products. You just want to put in all ones, right? That'll give you the green check mark, the product key. Again, it will be for that particular product, which is the suite that you're installing or building a network deployment for. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, so, when you're doing suites to install for your collections, just make sure you use all ones for the serial number and then the product key for that suite. Okay, Mark, I'll move to the next slide. So this is information that Autodesk published uh, a while back for a collection, and we just wanted to pass along. When we're talking about a single-user collection, and when Darren talks about a multi-user collection, there's some, uh, when it's related to collection license, there's some different rules. So in a collection, a user can go to a machine and launch a application associated to their collection. 
they can actually go to another machine, which it's got to be hard for a person to be in two locations working on the computer at the same time, but it allows them to sign in and use another collection like, uh, application. So for example, I could be running AutoCAD on my machine, go to my CoWorks machine, log on, and I can work on AutoCAD electrical or AutoCAD architecture or whatever, you know, whatever is part of my collection. The key you have to keep in mind is that you must follow the Autodesk business rule. That means you can't do it more than two times. And it has to be the person, all right? So it doesn't mean if I log in with my account, go to Darren's machine, log on with my account, doesn't mean that Darren can use my Autodesk ID to use the software, all right? So just keep that in mind. It has to be the same person, same ID. Next. And I just want to add one more here, Mark. Um, so some people try to get around this rule by, you know, just trying it and see what happens if they try to launch AutoCAD on one machine and also on another machine. The thing about a single user and you logging in is, remember, your actions or your um, licensing um, checks are going to the Autodesk server, right, to enter your Autodesk account, I'm sorry. So in your Autodesk account, you have a machine section in there that shows you what machine that user was actually using the software on and if it's, whether or not it's updated or not. So if you see two machines in there with the same user, you know, that's fine. So that's not going to throw up a red flag. The, the thing is, the ID won't even allow you to use both products on two different machines or the same product on two different machines at the same time. So that's what... That's all I wanted to say there. Sorry. All right, so moving on to the next slide here. So in regards to uh, network licenses, in regards to industry collections, you know, the rule is basically consume um, a single license for all legacy versions. So you want to open one product that's a higher version, and then you'll use that same license for any other products. For collections, though, when you go and borrow a license, you're only borrowing it for that product that you have open at the time. So if you open AutoCAD and it's using the collection license and you borrow that license, it's only going to be a collection license for AutoCAD. So if you're going to need, you know, Inventor and Revit off-site as well, you want to make sure you open up Inventor and Revit and borrow the license again. So what happens at that point, right? Now you see instead of using or borrowing one license, you're borrowing three licenses at that point because now you have AutoCAD, Revit, and Inventor. So how do we get around that? One way is to get around that is to have uh, machines that are used for off-site purposes, like when you're um, out in the field or even working from home. You'd use a work-from-home license, right? So that way you can install the software on the machine that's going to be out of the office and it would be a single user license at that point. That person can use a machine anytime, anywhere, as long as it's not in the same office location where your network licenses reside. Okay, so borrow licenses are for off-site use. Home use licenses are also for off-site use. Lowest product, vertical product launch. So this is talking about the order in which you're launching products. So you can't open up an AutoCAD license or open AutoCAD, pull a collection, and then next go to Inventor and open that one because at that point you're going to use two licenses. It's not like in uh, maintenance for Inventor licenses, how that used to work. Okay, so when you launched Inventor um, and then you launched Inventor Professional, it will put that license back the uh, Inventor lower license. So it doesn't work that way. So what you want to do is you want to open the first product as the highest product. So Inventor will be opened. Next you will go and launch AutoCAD. At that point you're only consuming one license. This is only in regards to collections. So uh, this is not something that you will see in your maintenance um, and how that works. So that's different. The given user is not permitted to actually use or consume another license on a separate machine. So you can't go to or be on one machine and, well, this is a, a rule that's by Autodesk, okay? So technically you can't actually have a machine open on your machine or 
I'm sorry, the software open on your machine, log into the software, then go to another machine and log into the same software, because now you're using two licenses for the same user for two different machines. And sometimes what will happen is you'll end up only using one, and that's not actually permitted. So that's why that's a rule that we want to kind of stay away from or shy away from. In regards to cloud credits, this is uh, this is a big one. Uh, we've seen this with some of our customers. So cloud credits are not transferable. So you can't transfer your maintenance contract to a subscription and keep your cloud credits. Once you do that, your cloud credits are expired once your maintenance contract expires. So if you purchased 100 cloud credits and next week you're going to renew, you want to make sure you use all those 100 contracts that week because next week your contract is going to end and those cloud credits are no longer going to be available to you. Okay, so you, you lose all those cloud credits when you switch over. That's basically the rule here or the idea here. Um, so another thing that some people don't, are, are not aware of is that cloud credits are only good for one year. Okay, so once you, so how do you get cloud credits, first of all? Okay, so once you create a, your, your Autodesk account for the first time, you're giving 100 cloud credits. Those cloud credits are good from the time you created that account until one year from that point. So if I created January 1st, 2016, January 1st, 2017, I no longer have access to those credits, whether or not I used them or it doesn't matter. They're gone. It's the same thing if you was to purchase cloud credits. So if you purchase them, 100 credits on January 1, 2016, 2017, January 1, they're gone. So when you purchase cloud credits, make sure you use them before your contract end and definitely before you move to subscription. With that, um, is there any other questions? That's pretty much our last slide is to uh, thank you guys for uh, being on the call with us and listening to what we have to uh, discuss in regards to move to subscription because it's definitely a lot of talk out there in regards to how we do this, how we do that, where's the information, right? So that's what we're here for, and we're glad that you guys spent the time to uh, look at this video or be on the webcast. So I see we have some questions here. Yep, so one of the questions is, is you know, can I get a network license um, uh, for temporary users? So in the network, when you... When you talk about a single user subscription, you can get it as a monthly, um, bi-monthly, quarterly, and yearly. Where in a multi-user subscription, it's one year. That's the minimum that you can get because the reason is you don't want to be generating a license file every month because of that, that termination date. So when you talk about a multi-user license, it's a, it's a minimum of a one-year term. That's correct. So we have another question here. So why when uh, using a single user subscription do you need to enter both the serial number and the product key as well as sign in? So the idea there is to know whether or not if that user actually have a serial number, right? So some people may have your serial number information but left the company, right? So now you knock them off of your contract from the Autodesk account standpoint. You remove their access. But let's just say they went home and tried to use it again. They won't be able to even though they know your serial number. But the serial number basically ties you to that contract for that product. So that's why Autodesk make us put in the serial number and product key as well as sign in. So the serial number just verifies that, okay, well, this is a single user license. It's not multi-user. So this is single user, so let's see if you have access. So go ahead and sign in for me, and we'll check. So is there any other questions? Or another thing, guys, if there is anything that you want to see in regards to videos or content um, that will help you in this transition or even providing you with more information, please put it in the questions area or get it to us some way so that way we can generate that content for you guys. So there we have another one. This webinar be available on demand? Yes, it will. So um, Ellen, who is our marketing expert here at Synergist, she will be giving you guys a link 
to uh, this recording as well as uh, post it on our site so you guys can see it. So yes, it will be available. All right, I guess that's it. You're welcome and you guys have a good day.